I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Glenn Tony Robertson will discuss a model of quantum gravity as an energy shell of quantum fluctuations, which predicts that accelerated objects produce a quantum warp field when accelerated to any speed. Glenn has over 40 years of experience in propulsion and helped establish the Advanced Propulsion Research Center at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He holds 10 patents and has published over 20 papers on propulsion and power generation. He established both the Institute for Advanced Studies in Space Propulsion and Energy Sciences and exotic propulsion organizations, which were created to investigate the basic physics of future space propulsion concepts. I go by two names, by Glenn and Tony. Some people know me by Glenn, some people know me by Tony. I write most of my papers in Glenn, but uh, this is kind of my background. I got uh, BS in physics and math and a uh, master of science in operations research. I worked for the government for about 39 plus years, 31 of them with NASA, retired in 2018. Uh, in 2008, as an outside at NASA TV, I formed the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Space Propulsion and Energy Sciences and held the uh, um, a, a conference with that, which Tom mentioned earlier, the Space Propulsion and Energy Science International Forum. Uh, we closed that down in about 2014. We stopped having the forums, and I'm going to blame part of it on Paul, because he started his own conference and pulled about half of our people away for, to go to that one. And then there was a bunch of other ones that started that around the same time, so we kind of shut it down. I really would like to start doing something again, but uh, we'll see. I've, uh, far, I've got some books, uh, this uh, Gravity Superconductors a book with uh, Giovanni, which I'll show you the front of that in a minute. And then these other ones are just the conference books that we have. I've got numerous papers, but little, little of them are in journals and about 11 patents. Uh, I worked on the NASA Superconducting Gravity Team. This is me. I'm much younger then. This is probably in the around 2000 time frame. Uh, there's Ning Lee over here. And uh, this is my boss, Witt. Uh, Ron Kozer and David Nover were from the Science Directorate, which Ning actually came through Witt to me, and we, uh, and we were forced to bring the Science Directorate involved in, into there. That's the large disk we made to do. I don't remember if it was 11 inches or 12 inches, but it was something like that. And then this is the only paper that was done that had my name in it. There's a second paper with David Nover and Ron Kozar, but uh, I, they didn't offer to put any of us on that. Um, the book I did with uh, Giovanni Monese, I'm the, the second editor on that book. I, I did two chapters in that book. If you wanna know why a, a superconductor can create a gravity wave, read my chapter. Uh, and this uh, second chapter is sort of related to what I'm going to present today. It sort of has some earlier, earlier information in it, but it's completely different than what I'm going to present today. And what I'm presenting today then is uh, what I'm calling quantum gravity as a quantum work field. Uh, if you go up to ResearchGate, you can find this paper and I just updated it. So you can go look at it. It has a lot more material in it than what I'm going to present. Basically, all I'm really going to present today is the gravity portion of it with a little bit of an acceleration towards the end, but it's basically just the model. So it's it's it, it starts from somebody else's theory, but it's it's just a model. And I think anybody that has any device that creates an acceleration, I can model that under this model. I firmly believe that. And basically, how it starts is under this paper by. Uh, Curry and Weltman called Chameleon Cosmology, they have this term which they call a thin shell. Uh, they call it a thin shell mechanism, but this is the equation they have in their paper. And everything on this page you can actually use to derive this form, which what I, I've been using uh, since I started writing papers on this. Uh, basically, what you have here is a, a, an energy scale factor, which has the cosmological constant in it and the Planck um, length in it. Uh, this is the, uh, the reduced Planck length. It's just the Planck length with uh, two pi, I think, in it. Uh, this is the density of the, of the object you're, you're talking about, which say would be the Earth. 
the radius of the object you're talking about would be, and the atmosphere that's around it. In the in uh, chameleon cosmology, they have a um, a coupling factor which follows the uh, atmosphere, which I removed because it's going to always be one, and even in their papers, they they set that to approximately one. But I'd, I've added a second one in it because you need it uh, for what I, what I'm doing in this in this paper. But basically, their their the chameleon cosmology model is you have a mass, and around that mass there's there's a thin shell which they give by this term, comes from this equation here. So, you, so the mass has a density and the mass has a radius that feeds into the, into the formulation for this thin shell. And it's, this is a, the thin shell thickness. The, this coupling factor can be uh, calculated in two ways. You can just take, uh, uh, if you look at my paper, I have what I call an energy density formula, which comes out like this in the paper, which then to condenses down just to high Planck's, uh, uh, reduced Planck's constant fetal light over this thin shell to the fourth power, which I show in the paper is actually equal to one half the density of your object times the speed of light squared. And, and so, so then if you take this uh, thin shell, put it into this form, throw it all together, you actually calculate this uh, this coupling factor that I, I, I put in. And you can do that a different way by taking this energy density uh, formula and, and this thin shell throw. I'm gonna throw, recalculate the gravity formula into a density equation and then throw in this, this equation into the density, you get this guy. Then if you throw this, uh, uh, this equation into for this guy, then you can recalculate this, this coupling factor and it comes out to about, 0.691. And coupling factors are kind of something important in, in what I'm doing here. So I'll keep going. Uh, gravity in a thin shell, you take what I just showed you, basically you, you can calculate gravity in terms of this thin shell uh, thickness to the fourth power uh, by using this formula. And I, I had, a, had a, but, a model that I've been doing for about since 2009 that I called, I've been calling chameleon cosmology that I knew had to fit into this, uh, a, a gravity had to fit into it, but I never could figure it out. But uh, I was listening to um, Tom Vallone's coffee conference a year or so ago and, and a guy named Fleming gave me an idea that helped me work this gravity equation out to look like this. But basically what I was missing was actually this term in the long run. Uh, so I have to throw out a keto to Fleming. Uh, from the standpoint of quantum gravity, this energy density has to have an associated wavelength. So, so what, you can, what you can do from this equation here is this, this thickness then, uh, this thin shell thickness actually is the wavelength of the energy that's actually in this shell, uh, thin shell. And so you set the, the thickness to the wavelength to, to the formula I showed before, which, which is related to the density of the of your object, which then basically says that the chameleon thin shell is an energy shell of quantum quantum energy shell of quantum fluctuations. And it, and and I wrote gravity in terms of this energy. So it comes out to be the fourth power of the quantum energy in the in the in this shell around the objects, uh, which I said therefore gravity mediated by the quantum energy and objects energy shell of quantum fluctuations, which is the same thing as a thin shell. Now, if you look at the uh, energy in there and the wavelengths uh, from the standpoint of a mass fluctuation, you can write the quantum equations in each term and come out with a, uh, a mass uh, uh, that's in here that comes out to this equation. And in the paper I showed that for the earth, the uh, wavelength is about seven times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Uh, and it yields a mass of about 1.96, 10 to the minus 30 kilograms, which is approximately uh, 2.15 times the mass of an electron, which kind of indicates that the quantum energy fluctuations at the surface of the earth is a electron pair type phenomenon. I kind of repeat this in a different way, but uh, uh, in other words, the electron pair interactions about atoms at the surface of objects 
result in a teeny fluctuations of elementary par particles emanating from the surface of the object. And the reason I say they're, they're, they're elementary particles, they can't be electrons, otherwise the Earth would be glowing, basically, if you put these fluctuations of electrons on the surface. So it has to be something fluctuating that's, non, that's not charged. Uh, okay. Now, if you take uh, what I just did before, you, you, you can put this mass in terms of the density by this equation, throw that back into the gravity equation, and so, so you end up having an equation that's related to the mass that's vibrating at a, at a wavelength uh, here, uh, the wavelength you can calculate. My camera is actually in the way of everything here, so I can't see things. But anyway, you can rewrite this energy density using, using this into this equation, which is equal to this. When you do that, you end up with the mass times C, which is a momentum, which then is equal to this, which is then equal to the Planck length over the uh, wavelength, which is actually the equation for quantum momentum, which kind of means the thin shell carries momentum. And I just as a side note, if you let this mass be two times the uh, uh, mass of electron, and you have to have some kind of coupling constant in here, which for the Earth, it comes out to about actually about one. So it's really not that much of a, of, of a factor in here. I also want to know this assumes no charge. There's no, no charge in any of these equations. And also, if you take this frequency for the Earth and put it into the, um, the um, wavelength equation, into the frequency equation, it comes out to be about 10 to the 7 terahertz frequency that these uh, masses are oscillating at. Now, if you take a step back in time and look at the, look at the universe where it's just one mass, then you can take that wavelength equation uh, as a as increments away from the mass, uh, with, as a density of increments away from the mass. Which, if you keep the mass constant, it's just a, a function of the radius of the mass, so that you end up having uh, at every increment out to uh, infinity, you have you can calculate these wavelengths within within these uh, within these rings. Uh, the blue line I'm indicating is a random fluctuation of elementary particles emitted at the surface. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, I've inferred this in my paper as a, as, a, as all these rings out to infinity as a as a as an er, um, energy shells of quantum fluctuations field. So it so basically just says this, so this is a field, and when you take that as being a field, then it infers that space time is a time wise compilation of of all these rings of, uh, of energy from all the masses in the universe over time that are muddled together, muddled energy shells of quantum fluctuations. And you can see that if you take this form of the equation, which I showed you earlier, which has this wavelength in it and divide it up into one side that is the energy shells of quantum fluctuations, and the other side basically is your space time, which is inferred by the gravity in here, which this equation is just really the the uh, gravitational constants over the density of your objects. Uh, I note that there is no indication that the, these energy shells are the same uh, uh, same thing as vacuum energy. It's more to say that they they actually are are telling you that space time has these energy fluctuations associated with it. And because of that, you can model this field as as, as gravitational gradients or as your space-time uh, field, you, you just you just have to take the equation and put it back into whatever these equations generate these, and come up with the same thing. Uh, now, from my from my comedian acceleration model I've been doing for years, which I which is a differential thin shell model, and I apply this to this new gravity information I, that I have. Uh, the, then you, then you, what, what you have is, the, uh, is uh, uh, wavelengths on either side of your mass that are, that are different. They're, they're differential from each other. And it's this differential that causes your, your gravitational force. And you can see some timeline history. I, I reported this model in 2009. Uh, at that time, it wasn't called a chameleon acceleration. But in 2017, 17, I brought in the concept of entanglement. And what the entanglement means is that these 
the, because the, these thin shells actually go out to infinity from a mass and mix with other things and form this field, then they're entangled to, to the field uh, on both sides. But their entanglement is different. So you can write the gravity equation in this, this way, where you have a forward and, a forward and aft uh, wavelength that are, that are different sizes. Uh, and, and then if you take these equations and replace these densities uh, with a coupling factor, which is, a, which is your coupling factor to your field, where, where your aft uh, coupling is greater than your forward uh, coupling, coupling, and throw it back in here and you get this equation. And if you assume that coupling is due to the density of the object, you're, you're, that you're the gravitational object, say the Earth, uh, uh, then you throw it in this equation, it pops out like this if you assume that the aft coupling minus forward coupling is one. Uh, okay. And you can take this same model and apply it to the acceleration of the universe, where basically you're, you're, you're assuming that the, your, your couplings to the universe on the forward and aft sides are different. Uh, and I actually did this model but way back in 2009. Uh, so, so, so it's not a new model to me, but maybe you guys haven't seen it. But you can, if you assume the gravity equations as acceleration equation, then you can re say the acceleration on, on objects in the universe is given by this, e this equation where you have the, the coupling on, on, on either side and you use the uh, density of the object that's uh, being accelerated because in far space, the uh, gravitational field of the object accelerating is greater than that of the universe uh, gravity attraction. So you, you come out with an equation like this with the coupling factors. And the only thing you really assume is that the aft is greater than the forward. So it's, it's not, so it's greater than zero. And you can actually apply this to the rocket equation, rocket model too. Um, <clears throat> if you, this EX assumes the exhaust gas. So, so the exhaust gas being accelerated out through the nozzle of a, a rocket is actually causing a, a, an increased density that's greater than the, the changing density of the rocket since it's losing uh, propellant. And, uh, and in the uh, um, chameleon acceleration model, I show that this changing uh, uh, density in the nozzle is a, is a function of the acceleration of the exhaust gas over, over the uh, gravity field that you're in such that this becomes much, much larger than the change in, in here, which fit, which from the density equations that I gave earlier, the, the wavelength associated with the nozzle, nozzle side is much, much smaller than that in the forward side. So you, from the acceleration equations that I have before, you get an acceleration uh, going towards space um, uh, due to the change in the couplings to the because you're now coupling to this density instead of the Earth's density. And, and so you get moving forward. And you can look at, I'm not going to get into the equations, but if you look at this paper is where I actually formulated the, uh, the new model for my uh, chameleon acceleration um, equation, which came from looking at the uh, propulsion equation, a repulsion model. And then you take what I've, those models I've shown you and just put it into a quantum field type of model. Then uh, what you, uh, th this is highly exaggerated because this thin shell around a mass is tiny. It's really, it's, you know, you're on an order of 10 to the minus 12 for the earth. Uh, but you, what you have an accelerating object is that the wavelength on the aft side gets smaller than the wavelength on the forward side. So your energy on the aft side is, is greater than the energy on your forward side. It would, you can interpret it as the aft side contraction, energy contraction, and the front side, the energy expansion, which makes it look like the field is, 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 it, is expanding on the, on the aft side and contracting on the forward side. Uh, and I put these earls in, interpret the uh, momentum that's in these shells, which you can change in momentum you can get by this, the longer the uh, length, uh, the wavelength is, the smaller the density by this density equation here. So you have a greater momentum pushing on this side 
than you have on this side. So, so if the change in momentum is actually positive because of that. But if you take this model and the other and the other models I to interpret it, then you have this change in quantum fluctuation contraction of these shells here, which looks like a field expansion, which looks like space-time expansion on this side. And on the other side, you have the, the quantum fluctuation expansion, which looks like a field contraction, which looks like space-time contraction. So basically these two models are the same. So what I'm saying is that a warp field is created about an accelerated object at any speed. And that's pretty much for the model. I just wanted to make a point that Mr. Michael Boyd pointed this out last time that the uh, solar flares um, were slowing radioactive decay. If you assume that these solar flares are somehow changing or putting a ripple in the quantum energy that's going from the sun to the earth and, and oscillating the uh, your, your energy shell about the earth, then you can the thesis can be that these these energy ripples associated with solar flares cause a vibration in the Earth's um, energy shell that uh, results in, in a probability change in emission of radiation. However, if this is the case, there should also be a, 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 a ripple in the Earth's gravitation at the same time and in other quantum systems that are, are that are associated with it due to the fact that, that there's a, some kind of electron pair uh, uh, interaction with this. And there actually is some papers out there that talk about um, a seasonal effect on the on these uh, Josephs and junctions that they used as a they call it a Zener reference, and you can and you can see that uh, in this ripple here, the peaks occur about every March first over this five year period that they measure this. So and and uh, so this. So what this Josephson standard is a Josephson junction. So it's a superconducting Josephson junction that they're using to uh, have a 10 volt standard that they use to calibrate Zener diodes, I think is what, what it's all about. And uh, I have this paper, but I don't know where, where it was published. I also have a presentation associated with this if anybody wants it. But here's another paper that's related uh, to this. You want to see it. And this is basically everything I was going to present today. There's a lot more information in my paper. I even do some acceleration models uh, in the back end of my paper. Uh, the inertia model I do in my paper it, it probably fits the uh, uh, um, asymmetric capacitors that uh, Hector is um, working on. Um, so if you want to talk about this model related to that, I, I don't think there's anything that accelerates that can't fit this model. So if you have something, uh, some device you're getting some kind of effect out of, then I probably can model that under this under this model. But you'll have you'll have to determine what these coupling factors are from 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 what you're doing. So if you've got magnetic electric fields in here, they play into that coupling factors uh, for your for your fields. Oh, and, okay. so Tony, does it, it, that's just about it for your presentation then, or? Yeah, I didn't want to get it too long into it. Uh, I really didn't want to get into the acceleration models too much because I might be doing some stuff with somebody with that. So I didn't want to go totally public, but all that's in my paper, if you want to go pull my paper down off of uh, ResearchGate. 